the most important person to helping you maximize your net operating income is your property manager. You have to buy right. You never get back what you lost on the front end, but then how well that property is managed day to day. Because the two levers that you really have to manipulate are your ability to capture market rent. And then beyond that, you know, yes, you should shop around for property insurance, but there is a floor there. Taxes only go one direction. Tenants have to use a certain amount of utilities. People need light and water in their homes. And so it's that property's manager's ability to capture market rents for you and then to understand what type of repairs or capital expenditures are needed so they can help you prepare for them and then their ability to execute on them, which is what makes them so important in the acquisition of the property. It is a common saying amongst real estate investors that you make money when you buy, not when you sell. While this catchy phrase has value, it fails to convey how easy it is to lose money through poor property management. Whether you self-manage or hire a professional, it is important to understand how to navigate the common pitfalls and challenges with rental properties without losing your shirt or your mind. That's why you have tuned in to Maximizing Your Property Value, the apartment owner's guide to operating rental properties as a successful business. I'm your host, John Stiles, real estate agent and team leader of the VIP Real Estate Group at Bridge Realty. As a current multifamily investor and former property manager myself, I understand the headaches and difficulties of keeping an investment property from becoming a money pit and time sucker. It takes a solid business plan, it takes tested systems, and it takes key team members to actually find success. So let's take a deep dive and maximize your property value. Welcome back everybody to another edition of Maximizing Your Property Value. And I am pleased to introduce you this morning, uh, Matt Browner, who is the managing partner at Northwoods Servicing, which manages over or nearly a thousand rental units around the Twin Cities. And Matt, thank you so much for coming in today. Absolutely. Appreciate you having me. And we're certainly proud of our company. We actually have an ownership stake in close to a thousand units in the Twin Cities and across the country. Doors Under Management is probably closer to a hundred. Our property management company is what we're growing out right now. Got it. Okay. Well, why don't you fill us in a little bit more about how you got to this point right now? Like, where did you start off, and um, yeah, how'd you get to where you're at now? Sure. So I met five other guys. We have six partners in the company. We met back in 2011. We got together to throw 50 bucks a month at the stock market and drink beer. And it was more of the latter and less of the former. And there were a couple of guys within that larger group that said, hey, we're interested in purchasing real estate. Half the group said that's a terrible idea because it was 2011. And the other half said, I'll think about it. So we got together at Perkins. None of us knew... Uh, the entire group. We knew individual members within the group. And I, honestly, at the time, I never thought it would be much more than a couple of rent houses. We started investing in townhomes because we didn't have a lot of money and it was a good way to amortize your risk because if you did your homework on the HOA, they would take care of the exterior portions of the property, some of your major capex issues that can come up. And so we all wrote checks. I think at that time it was a $5,000 check, all the cash I had to my name, pretty much. I was a single guy. I was like, well, if I lose this, I'll figure it out from here. And from there, that was 2011, we were able to grow about you know four or five properties every couple of years. We primarily focused in townhomes. And then things really changed for us in 2015. A couple of key things, we met some other investment partners who were doing apartment deals around the Twin Cities. And then we also got connected with Bridgewater Bank, and that was the first true commercial bank that we had seen. And when you have the right financing partner, it can change your business. And so there we got into multifamily. I was actually down in Texas at the time because I lived in Minnesota, moved away to do some fundraising for a nonprofit, made my way down to Austin, Texas, and stayed involved with the company as we did, uh, continue to grow, and I was managing things remotely. And then in 2017, when the company had grown, at that point in time, we were probably close to like... 350 doors that we had invested in or that we owned. Uh, the company had the need and the opportunity to have somebody do this full time. And I was really looking to be planted, to stop traveling as much as I was. And it was just a wonderful opportunity to do something I loved, to do something I felt called to do. And that's what brought me up here and where we are today. Wow, that's that's really neat. Um, 
you know, I didn't plan this question, but tell me a little bit about um, investing with partners. Because I think a lot of people maybe start off with just their own uh, their own investments. But it sounds like you've started with a group of people. And so tell me about the dynamics about that. Sure. So there were six of us at the time. And it's funny that you asked that question because that's probably the question I get the most is, how have you guys been able to get along for this amount of time? People are shocked that we haven't you know, gone to the mats over a $100,000 townhome. And in many regards, we probably have been lucky. You know, We all met when we were pretty young. I think only two of us were married at the time. There were no kids. So you were willing to take a little bit more risks than you would be if you have four or three kids on your own and you're thinking about things a little bit differently. But I really credit, so Ben Ferret, who's my other partner that works with me full time now, he just recently left his job at Target. You know, I still remember the first time we all got together, Ben sat us down and said, well, what's everybody looking for out of this? Let's make sure we're on the same page. It wasn't anything really formal, but that really started the culture of our relationship of being incredibly forthright in that regard. And we still talk because we meet quarterly. Uh, ben and I obviously touch the business more so than the other four do now because we do it day to day. But it's, all right, what is the health of the business need? But then what do you need out of the company in terms of where is your financial plan taking you and your family? So there's a pretty open dialogue in that regard. Yeah, it can present challenges. But for us, it's been just wonderful opportunities because of the connections where we've been able to scale people that we've met. All the business opportunities that have come to us have been through personal connections through the partners. And then we've had people bless us with investments that we've been able to grow and scale our company. And all of those have been through personal relationships as well through one of the partners or through other investors that we've worked with along the way. Okay. Very nice. So as your company developed, did you have uh, certain focuses as far as, I think you've mentioned townhouses, and then you, how did you grow into the multifamily? And, and what, is, um, what does that look like now? Are you, are you looking for 10 unit buildings, 100 unit buildings, or you know, what is your focus now? Sure, that's a great question. You know, in 2011, there was a little bit of an, almost an aberration in the market. Yes, things had trended downward significantly, but townhomes where there were still healthy associations, you know, I'll always remember our first townhome we bought, it's a two, it's no, it's three bedroom, two and a half bath, it's about 1,800 square feet, and we bought that home for $80,000. And that place rents now for close to $1,500 a month. And so the values were totally out of sync with what you could rent them for. And so that's what we first focused on. And we saw that market hold until about 2014. That's when you saw this townhome market start to come back, frankly, as people stopped defaulting on their own mortgages. So banks would lend more aggressively and then the value, so it didn't make sense to rent them. I think the last townhome we purchased was actually maybe in the spring of 17. And then we did what a lot of people do. We moved up to duplexes and fourplexes. And some of those have been wonderful investments for us. I would also say that through that process, it's also been where we've learned some of our most valuable lessons. You know, around here in the Twin Cities, we have duplexes that were built turn of the century. And I don't mean 2000, I mean 1900. And so as we're getting started, we're so green. We're like, oh yeah, we can make any of these properties work. Well, there are a lot more things that are going to break in a duplex that was built in 1900 than in a townhome that was built in 1993. So we had to take some of those lumps along the way. We've held on to a few of those, but then as I mentioned earlier in about 2015, and I'm kind of embarrassed to say, but we had no idea like that these types of apartment investments that you'll hear about, different syndications, different joint ventures, like I had no idea that those even existed. So the first one that was brought to us, we're like, oh my gosh, yeah, this, this looks wonderful. Like, thank you for including us. We'd love to do this. And we purchased into a portfolio of like 10 to, there was a failed condo conversion in there of like 32 out of 48 units that we bought into. And then that same syndicator brought another building to us about 10 months later. It was a 64 unit where a widow had owned it. Not when we were actually part of the leadership team where um, we were considered part of the sponsors there because we were helping to raise a significant amount of money. But uh, a widow had inherited like this 64 unit building and she was keeping half the units vacant for storage. So our eyes just became transformed by what we were seeing in these returns. And then we like property management a lot. One, because we believe it's the most successful, it's the most important ingredient for 
<laughs> to plug the podcast here for maximizing your property's value. <laughs> but then it also allows you to pay yourself along the way. So we've invested in some very large deals. We've been a part of the management team and general partnership for deals upwards of 171 units here in the Twin Cities. We're really focused on, I would say, like 20 to 40 units. We like the 1960s, 1970s product because we think there's a stable tenant base that lives there. We've learned the repairs that come up. You know, people in property management will joke about this. You like the fact that they're stacked. So when there is inevitably a leak, the units, it's easy to locate. They're easy to turn. And you'll also get a lot of mom and pop owners in that space as well. So you can, it's always been hard to find good deals. It's especially hard now, but the major players, they don't go below anything $10 million. And so if you can find something in that kind of three to $5 million price range, you can usually find a deal. Yeah, that's great. A lot of things you've said there. Uh, one thing I'll, you know, you said it's almost embarrassing that you didn't know about these deals that, out there. Well, I mean, you don't know until you know it, right? Right. I mean, I started in real estate way back in 2010, knowing that this is a good idea, right? But I didn't know really what I needed to know. So probably in 2014 or 15 is when I started to actually get some education about real estate and learn about so many different strategies and ways that you can approach it. So mm -hmm. you don't know until you know, right? Yeah, we've joked that one of our key strategies as a company is to talk to people. <laughs> Here's what we do. What do you do? What do you know? I, I'm a podcast junkie. And so I also try to listen to any number of publications that you'll see, a lot of the popular ones, and then try to read as much as I can because it's just amazing what the opportunities are out there just in the niche of apartment investing. Yeah, for sure. So geographically speaking, the properties that you own and manage, are they primarily just here in the Twin Cities or do you go beyond that? We have expanded. Um, primarily, we're here in the Twin Cities, and that's probably always going to be our strongest presence. We've expanded out into three other areas, all really on personal connections. We invested in a significant apartment building, 224 units down in Memphis, Tennessee, and it's because the deal sponsor lived here in the Twin Cities, and he was a part of a number of the other apartment deals that we had done, and he got involved down in Memphis and invited us to be a part of that. And then he also did a subsequent deal just about six weeks ago in Little Rock, Arkansas, a 218 unit that we were fortunate enough to be a part of. And then one of the unique aspects of our business is we have gotten involved with short-term rentals. Um, and we have only done that out in Las Vegas. We own and operate seven units at the MGM Signature, and it's one of the things that we're looking to grow. Uh, we're going to be pretty focused on Las Vegas in that regard because we really like the fact that you have the infrastructure there for short-term rental management. Uh, it's much more difficult if you just if you have a home that you're trying to rent out and almost operate as a hotel here in the Twin Cities or any other city, but when you're uh, operating within, a, as they call it, a, a condo hotel, within that space where there's somebody at the front desk to check people in and out, where there's a maid service to clean the units and they have the inventory, it makes it possible for us. So those are kind of the key areas of our business. Nice, very interesting. Uh, maybe another time we'll have to dig into that a little bit more. Yeah. I've got one Airbnb unit myself and oh, okay. here in the Twin Cities uh, in Minneapolis. And it's been a good experience. We're almost up to a year now in nice. operating it. So, yeah. Well, very good. Um, so what I wanted to get into now um, is how do, how do owners identify a good property management fit? You know, I think a lot of people, again, starting out, they might manage it themselves. Um, or if they do hire a manager, they might be frustrated with how things are going. So as somebody is beginning to look for a management company, what are some things that they should be looking for? Sure. You know, the couple of key things that come to mind are, no matter what the industry is, you can't replace good customer service. So you should have somebody that is responsive, a good communicator, very forthright, easy to work with, because uh, no matter what size of investment you're making, this is going to be one of your key partners, probably the most important partner you have in real estate investment. And then to dig in specifically on what makes a property manager good, I always think the best property managers have good systems. You know, are they system based or are they personality based? And if you want to hone in on the systems, I always like to see what are their processes for marketing and screening tenants, because one, Finding good tenants is going to solve so many of your problems, whether it's making sure to capture the highest net operating income you can or 
preserving your property. But as we've even seen here in Minneapolis as of late, it's an incredibly scrutinized process, screening for tenants. So having somebody that is aware of all local laws and regulations and has a process that adheres to those and can find tenants that meet your criteria is really, really important. And then looking into how they manage their property, is it just that they're responding when there are maintenance calls? Or are there processes built in place where they're regularly inspecting the property or other areas that they're looking to to maximize your value? How do they go about getting their rental comps? How are they going about setting up maintenance schedules for the property to make sure that they're minimizing any other capital expenditures that you might have later on? Or maybe you know, you are buying into an apartment building and it's a large value add investment. You know, do they have experience managing and working with the contractors that can execute a property or execute a project at this scale and do so as quick as you have to? Uh, what you've seen in that space, it's a thing we spend a lot of time on is when you are, you know, renovating a property, you want to go as big and as fast, obviously, as your cash will allow, but as big and as fast as you can. So I think those are the things to always be looking for as you start to evaluate a property manager. Do they have good customer service? And then can they think in terms of systems and can they walk you through, like, are there actual documented processes that you would expect out of a company to have to managing your property with a special focus on how they find their tenants? Yeah. And that's huge that those two things, the customer service and the systems, are really what this show is all about. And just the idea that if you're going to go and uh, operate your property just however you feel like that day, then things are probably not going to go as good as they could have. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about like one example that you talked about uh, visiting the property. How frequently, in your opinion, should a manager or somebody from the management team visit the property? Sure. I think it's incredibly important to be visible. And so generally all of our properties, we're visiting at least once a quarter. Um, some maybe more than others, depending on the property. It's nice actually if it's a single family home or a town home, you have the need to change the filters in the furnace as a good excuse for you being on site. Dave Ramsey has a great quote. He's like, just make sure they're not, you know, change the, changing the oil to the car on the family room floor. Like just being present, looking around, like, all right. And you can get a pretty good feel for how things are going just within a few moments of being uh, in the property. But then if you have larger you know, investments that you're making, larger renovation projects that you're taking on, you need to see, be seen and be present. There are contractors out there who work very hard. They're great to work with and they're uh, wonderful partners in this regard. But anytime you're deploying what could be a significant amount of money into a property, you need to be hands-on in that process and to understand what's happening. So depending on the scale of the investment or project you're taking on, you should be on site as much as once a week, again, accounting for all the different variables. Yeah, for sure. I, I know that um, things can really fall apart at a property. I mean, things just naturally break down. So if you're not there to see what's going on, and, and like you talked about, letting other people know that you care about it. You know, whether that's the tenants, or the contractors, you know, if they can actually see that you're involved, they'll pay more attention and be more on their best behavior mm -hmm. rather than if they're unsupervised. Right. And, you know, as you talk about caring for a property, and it is important and it's a key system that people need to have in place for how they monitor the property. What I talk to our own team about, as well as other owners that we work with, uh, you never get back what you lose on the front end. So as you evaluate a property and it's good to engage your property manager at this stage before you've actually purchased the property is understanding what that property needs. So if you are buying a home that was built in 1930, of okay, these are the types of repairs that are going to come up. These are the type of projects we need to take on so that you can adequately plan for those. But then especially making sure that you have the capital for it so that you can raise what you need on the front end or have it reserves as necessary and then deploy it throughout your plan for the property. Yep, for sure. A lot of people don't get into properties with enough reserves. Uh, we're not planning for that like we should. Right. So um, one thing I want to ask you about is how do you divide up responsibilities within the company as far as, you know, obviously I think leasing is probably pretty self-explanatory. You have your leasing agents, but then what else um, 
some some companies might be a portfolio management where there was one person that's responsible for everything and they know everything, or other companies really specialize and have different departments. So, but what do you guys do? Sure. So we're still a small company looking to grow and would love to be at a point even in a year or two from now when I can come back and talk to you about all the different departments that we have within our company. But where we have gone is first, we created uh, a position to oversee our leasing process. And that started pretty small for us. You know, it was just finding somebody dependable to show up and do the showings for us along the way. And she's really proven herself now. So she's taken over a lot more responsibility. And then from there, we're looking at maintenance and having a dependable person to take the inevitable calls that come in in the middle of the night or their emergency repairs that come up or that assist you on turning your units. And then the piece that we focused on after that was kind of our back office work. So all of our accounting, all of our reconciliations, anything to do with bookkeeping, that's what we've offloaded. And so you want to make sure that one, that's done right. But then and there's kind of two audiences of people I would speak to here, you know, one would be how you evaluate it. So making sure that all this is accounted for as you look for property managers, but then to other property managers just getting started, what I know I have to tell myself a lot is it can be easy to fall in the trap of, okay, I just want to do all these things myself and get them taken care of. But you always have to look at the highest and best use of your time. And so it becomes then, all right, if I'm able to hire somebody to take care of this, what else does that free me up to do specifically as it um, means for focusing on the growth of my business? Yeah. So then what is your role in the company? It's kind of going backwards a little bit in our conversation, but then how do you fit in that? Sure. So working for yourself, you have a hand in just about every department. So I am involved along the way. I'm not going and doing showings anymore, but um, working with our showing director closely, we speak almost every day just about any number of things that units that we're turning over, working with contractors who are taking care of various repairs for us. And then we've done a lot of work, as I alluded to earlier, on streamlining our accounting process. And we have somebody who's hired on now to take care of that. So where I'm trying to spend more and more of my time is we're still looking to acquire. We are looking to also build out our third-party management services. But I try to spend my time either looking for deals around the Twin Cities or looking for potential customers to grow our business with. Okay, wonderful. So... I'm going to transition to a part of the show that's called Tenants Make Me Laugh. Okay. And uh, I mean, if you've been in this business for any length of time, you know, there's some things you come across that are just, you know, crazy. And, you know, we, we obviously respect our tenants and, and value them. But sometimes you just think only in property management or only in right to business could this be happening. So right. do you have anything like that you can share with us today? You know, when you run a property management company, you almost become numb to it. And then like one story starts to beget another. So there are a couple that come to mind. Uh, one, I would say, um, just reinforces the idea of having good processes and, and where you spend your time. Um, I actually I had a duplex where um, we had owned it and the tenants had been really difficult to deal with. They had been rough on the property and we had actually elected to sell the property. And I was there on site to meet with them, to tell them, hey, we're going to sell the property and trying to walk them through, help them feel comfortable about it. And that did not go well from the get go. I actually got chased out of the house by the tenants and came back afterwards. And I was fine. I was safe. But I remember meeting with a friend of mine later on. He's like, what are you doing still going to properties like that? Like, that's not a conversation you have there. So uh, I reflect on that now to say, like, he was absolutely right. You know, one, I wasn't being very smart in terms of where I spent my time, but also thinking about delivering an emotional message to somebody who's living here. Hey, we're going to sell the home. So that's one story that comes to mind. But we've had all sorts of uh, interesting things happen from crazy things about what people have allowed their dogs to do the property. We replaced a whole kitchen because I'm pretty sure the guy let his um, dog go to the bathroom in the kitchen for the better part of a few months right before his lease ended. So uh, it, it's definitely a time where when you get property managers together, you can exchange some pretty crazy stories pretty quickly. Yeah, I can commiserate. Yeah. Um, well, that's an interesting example that you gave there of letting the tenant know that the property's going to be sold. Mm -hmm. because I think that's really important. Um, 
well, I think there's a lot of mixed views on it. Some people try to keep it really hush hush until even after the transaction has happened. There's um, legislation or, or city ordinances that are under consideration for giving tenants a certain amount of notice. Um, and, and I, you know, as a selling agent, I'm often wondering, okay, what's this owner's plan? Because mm -hmm. can I say anything? Do I have to be here like in disguise? Because you got to show the property and buyers right. need to see the property. So, right. I definitely don't regret telling the tenants where I was really stupid was how I went about telling the tenants. I should have been a meeting at my office or it should have been um, written communication going to the home because I happened to be in the area. I thought coming off more personal in that moment might help them put up with the showings a little bit better, but that wasn't the case. So uh, I definitely believe you need to be upfront and forthright treat people the way you would want to be treated. If I was living in a home and it was going to be being sold, even if the owner has the legal right to do showings, it's, I would want to know that that's going to happen and being able to give proper notice yeah. there. Uh, so just making sure I had that conversation a different way. Yep. Very good. Um, so that kind of leads me into my next segment of customer service and relationship management. So what systems have you th thought up or put into practice that really helps to make sure that the customer is having, or the, sorry, the tenant is having a good customer experience there through property. Sure. So whether that's me or my staff, we all have a commitment that we're going to respond to calls or emails within 24 hours. Obviously, if it's an emergency, it's much quicker than that. And we really rely a lot on our property management software. There's a lot of great ones out there. We particularly like Buildium, which is what we use. And that's great because it not only provides the tenants a means for submitting maintenance requests, which is what people most often think of here, and then they can track that. You can post updates so that they know when to expect the repairs to be completed, but then they can also access other important documents that they might need, whether it be their lease or a parking agreement. They can also see their lease ledger so they can understand what exactly they're being charged for, trying to provide as much transparency in that process as we can. And I know that those softwares aren't free. In fact, they can get really expensive. But if you are even just a handful of properties, I think it's something worth thinking about because I believe that not only does it improve your tenants' lives, it certainly makes things better for your rental owners. One of the strong commitments that we have is that the owners that we work with get accurate data on the financial performance of their property and it provides for that. But it then also allows you to grow your business faster. Yep. Yeah, that open communication with the tenants is really important. Um, so like you said, they can see where they're at with their balance. Uh, some some tenants might be like, well, I didn't know I was behind or I didn't know I had this charge. Mm -hmm. You know, so you say, well, it's right there in the portal. How do you get, what's your kind of use rates? Are, are tenants actually logging in and, and checking? Yeah, absolutely. I would say close to 80 to 85% of the tenants use them to pay their rent online. Um, there are some tenants who various circumstances can only pay via money order, uh, but that's for a number of different reasons. Uh, so I, it's something that's pretty widely accepted, especially in today's day and age. We call it the Amazon mentality where people just expect to be able to do a lot from their phones. Buildium has a great app and to be able to pretty much execute their entire lives through the course of an app. And the fact that you can do that now for someone's home is really an advantage. Yeah. Nice. Then thinking about customer service as it relates to the property owner, um, I'm assuming it's very similar with your software. The owner has a portal they can log into as well? Absolutely. So customer service, I think, starts from the get-go being very transparent about your company, what your capabilities are, what you currently manage, what you have the scale to take on, being upfront about your fee structure and how that works and having that laid out in a written agreement. All of our contracts are written. And then Buildium, again, provides wonderful customer service because uh, owners can actually receive their uh, the owner draw the money that they get paid over and above the expenses. Buildium can execute that and they're notified so that they're not searching for the money each month and they know when to expect it. Then they can look in what's really important for people who do invest in real estate is they want to see how the property performs. And there's any number of reports that they can see, whether it's the rent roll, how they're comparing to market rent, so they can see what their loss to lease 
is. They can see their income statement so they can see how the property is operating. They can see a rental owner statement so they can see a breakout of all the cash. Uh, that, again, I think in this day and age is just going to be expected. So investing in that, I'd say, is really important to your business. Yep. Something important, too, if you are a real estate investor hiring a property manager, it's what you should expect. Yep. So my next question, I think you can really appreciate being on the investor side of things and looking at properties even that are out of state. Um, some investors talk about their relationship with the property manager as managing the manager. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you balance you know, providing that top level customer service and attention to all these details without letting the owner kind of micromanage what you're doing and getting too much into your business? It's a great question. You know, I found that generally the more upfront I've been about what a property needs, and then if I've done my homework about what plan that we're putting through, no matter what the scale of that, you know, if we're going to be investing hundreds of thousands of dollars so that it's laid out there and that I'm communicating regularly, the people then are much more apt to trust you and to go along with the process. It's when that you go silent or you start missing milestones. That's when owners get nervous. That's when they start checking in more often. That's when they want to start going over the management agreement to see where you might not be upholding your end of the bargain. So what really comes to mind to me is how upfront can you be in focusing on what you know, communicating throughout the process, and then executing. Yeah, that makes sense. Being upfront with the owners, like you just said, Um, that can help a lot setting expectations. Now I actually have a question from our audience. So I'm just going to pull that up here. Hi, my name is Armando Scooey from Minneapolis, Minnesota. My question is, so I have a tenant offering to do caretaking services like mowing the lawn and shoveling snow. Um, I need these services to be done. Do you recommend having the tenant do it or should I have a third party do it instead? I think having a caretaker is a wonderful way to increase the value of your property. Whatever you can do to help the tenants see it as truly their home is going to solve so many challenges because then they're personally invested in it. And there are also, if you want to get down to the nitty gritty, so many maintenance issues that can be taken care of with just having somebody there on site to address it. So I would absolutely encourage him to utilize a caretaker That being said, I think a lot of people fall into a trap of having their caretaker agreements be verbal. Like everything else in real estate, there needs to be a written agreement where it spells out clearly what you're expecting of them, what time intervals they have to complete them. So, hey, I'm expecting you to mow the lawn every week. I'm expecting you within 12 hours of the snow ceasing that you will have the walkway shoveled off. Uh, I'm expecting that you will be able to spend one hour of cleaning if you've got a multi-unit property, vacant units, and that you will be there to meet the tenants to give them keys. This is what we're going to pay you. This is what you'll get for supplies. And then with the caretaker agreements that I have, they are at will. So either party can terminate them with written notice at any point in time. Yeah, that makes sense. Putting things in writing is really important in this business. Uh, I think a lot of people do things verbally. And, uh, you know, when something goes sideways, you know, it's like, well, he said, she said right. type of thing. So right. great advice. Well, I just want to talk to our audience briefly. And uh, we really want to invite you, if you've got any questions for our future guests, um, we would love to have you submit a question for our from the audience. And you can do that. There's going to be some notes in the show notes that just give you instructions for how to go about that. But it really helps the show to be a little bit more interactive and keep our guests on their toes. So appreciate it. All right. So, you know, as we know, uh, investment properties are based, the value of them are based on the NOI, net operating income. So I want to talk about income for a moment. Um, You know, a lot of property owners they don't always increase their rents because they really value having kind of stable tenants and they don't want to upset the boat. Um, but, and that makes a lot of sense. However, they're losing out on a lot of potential value there. So when they go to sell, you know, like, well, rents could be 900, but they're only 700. So what are um, recommendations that you have for property owners for how to, you know, keep the income increasing or going up as, as it should, but not upsetting the boat too much. Right. I think 
a good example that comes to mind is the idea of a frog in a boiling pot of water. You turn the water up gently, you throw the frog into a boiling pot of water right away, it's going to jump right out. So whether it's other owners, other investors I've talked to, they've seen the property and they're like, oh, I can increase rents 150 bucks in one year per unit. And they go in there, they start that, and then all of a sudden their property is half vacant, which is a significant problem. The greatest expense you have in property management is vacancy. That's the number one thing you want to tackle. So people are right to be concerned about keeping their units filled. I would challenge that you don't want that concern to inhibit you from pushing rents because, as you said, if you are buying an investment property, one of the things that I like about it versus the sales comparison approach, which can be more subjective, on the investment side, it's an equation. What's the NOI divided by the cap rate? So the better job that you do pushing rents, then you can realize that when you sell the property. So it's making sure that you have a good handle on what the market rents are for the area, what the amenities that go along with those type of rents, and then looking at the tenant background. You know, if you've got you know, a property where maybe you could be renting it out for $100 more a month, but you have a tenant in there now who's been a great tenant, they pay on time, they take good care of their unit, then maybe you're thinking about a $25 a month increase over time. Because as I said, the expense you really want to avoid is the vacancy expense. Yep. Very good. Um, and what other revenue sources have you found besides the rent exa- itself? Well, to be a little bit redundant and go back to it, the better you can do at keeping the property filled and the money that you can uh, recapture from vacancy is always going to do a phenomenal job at keeping your owners happy at pushing up your net operating income. And then, you know, depending on the property, you can look to some auxiliary sources of income. So on a lot of our apartment buildings, we do put in air card readers for the washer and dryer. So your laundry income is significant there. I think if you've got an apartment building, you should always look at how you're paying for parking. There should be a charge that goes along with that. And then as you manage it as well, you know, one of the things that we talked about earlier was when you go back and you see the property and you tour the property on a regular basis and you inspect it, that you're holding the tenants accountable to their lease. So if there have been damages that you are documented and you are organized enough to have the tenants bear their financial responsibility, which then helps minimize your expenses and pushes up your NOI. Yep. That makes sense. So you don't want to be having to pay for things that the tenant is responsible for doing. Okay, and then uh, moving over to expenses, you know, sometimes it can see, seem like, um, you know, everything's going wrong with your properties. This is breaking over here. This is breaking over there. Um, what are ways that you have found to keep kind of expenses and repairs under control? You know, this is one that I speak about from experience because as I joked earlier, when we started buying duplexes and fourplexes, almost irrespective of what year they were built in, and then get shocked when you try to do something as basic as replacing a water valve and all of a sudden you realize that you've got lead piping in a building and what you thought was going to be a $250 repair is now a $5,000 repair. So as I thought about the best way to approach that, I think it all goes back to evaluating and putting in the time on the front end. So understanding what you're buying, okay, what goes along with this property type? What type of expenses should I be anticipating? And I think that's a key role of a property manager. You know, if you're an investor looking to buy rental property and you have a manager that you trust and who has specific experience with that property type, that's the key time to have them involved because they can educate you as to what is going to come up. You can't change that, but you can change how you can prepare. So can you negotiate then on a price that allows you to allocate for those repairs or to make sure that you have enough cash for those over time to do more than just put on band-aids, but to fix the problem in a way that'll last. Yep. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Preparing your expenses, you know, if the, if the building's older and hasn't been updated with newer plumbing and electrical, then your routine expenses and your capital improvements need to be higher in your planning. Mm-hmm. Have you found any uh, repair issues or re- that um, are quite common and that maybe could be either avoided uh, by choosing a certain type of product or a certain brand or um, just something that could be done proactively to reduce that 
the frequency of that issue? I don't know that there are any specific brands that come to mind, but what I am thinking about is anything to do with water in a property, you want to make sure you fix that right the first time. What I tell my staff a lot is that vacancies and water leaking are our two greatest problems because they create domino effects where you know you can stop a leak, but then are you going to be dealing with mold later on? So generally in you know a water bill too a water bills what always stays with a property and you can see huge bills that'll truly shock you based on a three dollar toilet flapper that the tenant didn't notify you it speaks to the importance of inspecting them so always making sure that anything to do with water that you fix right the first time and that you understand the full scope of the problem yep that's that's really important i would agree 100 percent. often i go into properties and the toilet's running or uh, the shower's dripping or whatever it is. And just like, I wonder what, how much they're spending on water where they don't need to be. Right. So, perfect. Um, you've touched on my next t- topic quite a bit actually already, and that is the manager's role during acquisition or disposition. And so, sounds like you recommend the manager being quite involved. I do, because I believe that the most important person to helping you maximize your net operating income is your property manager. You have to buy right. You never get back what you lost on the front end, but then how well that property is managed day to day. Because the two levers that you really have to manipulate are your ability to capture market rent. And then beyond that, you know, yes, you should shop around for property insurance, but there is a floor there. Taxes only go one direction. Tenants have to use a certain amount of utilities. People need light and water in their homes. And so it's that property manager's ability to capture market rents for you and then to understand what type of repairs or capital expenditures are needed so they can help you prepare for them and then their ability to execute on them, which is what makes them so important in the acquisition of the property. Okay, so I'm going to move on to looking forward to the market. Um, Based on your experience with how quickly you're able to fill properties and what kind of uh, rent increases you've been able to do to make and request, uh, combined with any concessions that are required now in order to get people into the properties, what would you say is going to happen over the next 6 to 12 months in the rental market? Are we going to continue to see rental prices going up or is it going to kind of level off at all? What, in your, what do you think? Well, that seems to be the question on everyone's mind, including Jerome Powell's today as we're looking at what the Fed's going to do. So uh, anyone who tells you know, they know exactly what it's going to do, I would be cautious of that. Uh, as it pertains to the rental market, one of the reasons that we like investing in apartments is people do always need a place to live. If you go back to 2008 and you look at the default rates, like the default rates for single family home mortgages were around 4%. The default rates in multifamily investing was 0.4%. So something that's managed well where you have adequate cash reserves does allow you to ride out market fluctuations. Now, in the Twin Cities, during the worst of the recession, we dropped down to about or 8% vacancy rate. In, you won't always collect the same amount of rent against that, although we don't see huge fluctuations in rent prices. Uh, There, that does get pretty dependent and where I would say to people looking over, you know, the next six to 12 months is that it really depends on the property type. You know, personally, I don't invest in a lot of class A stuff or seek to own that at this point in time because, you know, that's going to be heavily dependent on the amenities that they offer. And my sense is that's the first stuff that's going to go when the next recession inevitably happens. The reason we like kind of your class C style apartment buildings, class B as well, is that you tend to have more stable tenant bases where even, again, going back to 2008, people may shift down. You may have a class A tenant uh, who is renting a class A apartment building, start to rent a class B or class C. So I just believe that those tenant bases are a little bit more stable. So class A, I would say I'm nervous. Class B, class C, I think it will be steady A. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, well, that is the majority of what I wanted to ask you about managing rental properties. Uh, And before we wrap up, I just want to switch the conversation a little bit back to yourself, allow the audience to learn a little bit more about yourself. So uh, my first question is, why do you get up in the morning? 
You know, I would love to tell you that every morning I wake up with this grand vision of who I'm going to be as a husband, as a dad, and what I'm going to do for my company. But that's not the case. Some days I get up in the morning just because I have to and I got to go to work. And I think that's important because you do have to grind it out no matter what, even if you're chasing after your dream job and you've left your you know, full-time job to become an entrepreneur, there are going to be times where it's that. It's a grind. And you can't be afraid of that. The reason, though, that I left my W-2 job to work full-time for myself was that uh, I believed in being planted, that I wanted to work in such a way that I could provide for my family, work towards financial freedom. My goal was to never be wealthy. My goal was to have my family be financially free and then to work alongside my family so that it would allow us to spend more time together. I believe strongly that you have to work, worship, and play all in the exact same place. And so being able to do that here in Minneapolis is what led me to this opportunity. And it was just so many instances over the last eight years of where we, uh, from when we started the company that uh, we were lucky and blessed enough to be able to grow the company and to be here that uh, I just feel like I'm, I'm following where God's called me to go. Nice. Very good. Um, so what person or event in your past has kind of been pivotal pivotal to who you are today? Gosh, it's another wonderful question. I've got a lot of great people who built into me over the course of my life, specifically as I came out of college and had a lot of growth and maturity to go through. Uh, I can tell you the most important person in my, in my life is my wife. Um, you know, she is who I've committed myself to and her to me as we strive to lead our family and care and love and disciple our kids. And so uh, I know that I work every day to try to be the husband that she deserves. So that's uh, probably who comes to mind the most. Wonderful. Okay, the last question is, what's the best way for our audience to get in touch with you if they'd like to learn more about your management services or just more of your philosophy on management? Sure. They're happy to go to our website, which is nwsproperties.com. Nancy, W's in world, S's in Sarah, properties, all spelled out, IES.com. Or they can send me an email at matt at nwsproperties.com. would love to have a conversation with them. Great. All right. Well, that's all we have for today, Matt. I really appreciate you coming in and sharing your insights on this topic. Hope you had a good time here. Appreciate the opportunity. Wonderful. And to everybody else out there, uh, we hope you the, wish you the best in maximizing your property value. We'll see you next time. The opinions shared on this show are for informational purposes only and should not be taken as a solicitation for representation or investment in any specific offering. Please consult with your financial, legal, tax, and real estate advisor before making any investment decisions. John Stiles is a licensed Minnesota real estate agent with Bridge Realty. Thanks for tuning in to Maximizing Your Property Value, the apartment owner's guide to operating rental properties as a successful business. If you're considering scaling up, downsizing, or right-sizing your real estate investment portfolio, it's important to know how to determine your property's value in today's market. That's why I've put together a free ebook for you called How to Calculate Your Investment Property's Value. To get your copy, go to www.realestatestyles.com forward slash value. Now, if you found any value in today's show, be sure to subscribe to our email newsletter, YouTube channel, and podcast through your favorite podcast player. All the links are in the show notes. And would you do me a big favor? Help me get the word out about this show by sharing with your friends on Facebook and LinkedIn. And lastly, we appreciate your five-star rating on iTunes. I really appreciate you and wish you the best in your real estate investing career. Signing off, I'm John Stiles with Bridge Realty. Make it a great day.